Well, hello. It is November the 5th, and we are so fortunate to have Leah Sipas. Am I saying your name right? Yes. Sipas. Okay. Um, and Leah is an accomplished science fiction writer, not only of adult science fiction, but for various intermediate ages. And uh, I'll get to that. But she has a track record of, you can look Leah up anyway, but she has been a, a Nebula Award nominee and she was the nominee for the World Fantasy Award, which thankfully has been, uh, they have taken that statue and changed it, <laughs> but I won't go off on that. Um, she is such a, a, a diverse writer that she covers many bases, including hard science, science fiction, which is the story we're going to talk about today. But she just told me, this is news, everyone, that she has a middle, a, a younger age, right? About eight yes. years old. And eight, eight to twelve is the eight to twelve, age and range. you can see behind Leah the name of her book, Thornwood. And I may be—I hope this is not a spoiler for my sister. She never comes to these. I may get a copy <laughs> for my sister because there's only two of us, and she's the younger sister. And these stories are traditional fairy tales told from the younger sibling of the main character, and I love that idea. So. And this is just a fraction, the tip of the iceberg of Leah Sipas and her work. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Leah, and uh, tell us what you want to tell us. And I hope we will get to that one story that I've been circulating. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. So the the description of this talk said it was going to be about my path to publication. Uh, and I say a couple of people mentioned that they're writers. So I'll start off with that. And then we can get to talking about individual stories. Um, so I've wanted to be a writer for as long as I can remember. I have it on record that when I was eight years old, my grandmother asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I'm going to be an author. To which my grandmother, who was an immigrant, said, that's not a good idea. Authors don't make a lot of money. <laughs> and she was right about that. But, you know, nevertheless, I, I went through a whole bunch of other trying to be practical things um, on the way. I actually was a lawyer for a while. Technically, I still am a lawyer, though I'm not practicing um, and eventually here I am, and I am in fact a full-time writer. Um, it took me many, many years to break into publishing. Um, starting out, I started sending stories and not, and manuscripts out when I was in high school. Um, most of them were not good enough to get published, so thankfully they weren't. Um, I, I did get pretty good at reading stories, and whenever I do this presentation for kids, I always pull out one of the first rejection letters I ever got, um, which was from a magazine which is now defunct, which is called Marion Zimmer Bradley's Fantasy Magazine, um, which we now know there was a lot of bad stuff going on behind the scenes with that whole publication. But at the time, it was my, you know, nobody knew about it at the time, or at least I didn't. There was no internet. It was my favorite magazine. I really wanted to publish a story there. Um, and all I got were rejection letters. And at one point, I got a rejection letter that said, thank you for sending us your story. Unfortunately, I could not work up enough interest in the characters to care whether they lived and did well or whether a convenient earthquake came and swallowed them all up on the last page. <laughs> um, so, you know, so I tell the story, M most rejections are much nicer than that. Most rejection letters are, you know, like the Snoopy rejection letters. Thank you for sending us your manuscript. It does not suit our needs at this time. Um, but all rejections can be a little bit crushing. And if you want to make it as a writer with very few exceptions, you just have to develop a thick skin, figure out a way to deal with rejections and keep on going. Um, and in the end, my first professionally published story was actually published in the pages of that magazine. So that same editor who sent me that very harsh rejection eventually, you know, actually paid me for my first story when I was 17 years old. So, you know, never give up, never surrender. Um, at the same time, I was sending in book manuscripts. So I started sending in book manuscripts when I was 17. And I got my, and in the beginning, they weren't good. Toward the, and I can see that, I could see that they were getting better because the responses I got from publishers changed from thanks, but no thanks to, oh, please send us the full manuscript, followed by a no thank you. Then it was, oh, not this one, but I would be interested in seeing your next one. And then it graduated to, can you revise this and send it back to us, which eventually ended up in a rejection. But, you know, you could kind of see that people were getting more and more interested as my skills developed. Um, so, and it was when I was 34 years old that I finally got my first actual book deal, which was for my first young adult book 
called, which was called Mistwood. It was published by HarperCollins. Um, I published four young adult fantasy novels with HarperCollins. Um, and, you know, I thought, well, this is it. I've got an editor. I've gotten published. I'm in. We're great. Um, so after the fourth book, I sent in my fifth book and they said, thank you, but no thank you. Um, and that led to basically to three and a half years where once again, I was just trying to write to send in books. I was actually trying to get a new agent um, and I wrote three full manuscripts that were rejected by everyone. So just because you're in doesn't mean you're in. You always, you know, the rejections, you know, basically are something you have to deal with throughout your career. And then finally, um, I actually got an agent with a young adult manuscript that I had written, which she was very excited about. She sent it out and could not get any publishers to publish it. Um, and then still working with that agent, I wrote the book that you see behind me, Thornwood, which is a middle grade book. And that ended up getting me a deal, you know, a six book deal. They wanted like six standalone books that were fairy tale retellings told from the points of view of younger siblings. So that was it. I was in for a while and I was good, but you know, I know that when this series ends, it's time to start all over again. So that's the writing life. And um, I hope it doesn't come off as too discouraging. You have to weather the rejections, but in the end, almost every writer I know who has the talent and the skill, and most importantly, the perseverance to just, you know, to keep going, to not take it personally, to understand that rejection is often about the market and not about you. And you can't get stuck on your one manuscript. You have to, you know, if, if nobody wants it right now, you have to say, well, maybe people will want it in 10 years. For now, I'm going to write something else. Um, and, you know, eventually you will succeed if, if you, you know, can keep trying and keep working on it. So that is my path to publication story. Um, I guess I'll ask if anyone has any questions about that or if you want to go on to talk specifically about short fiction. Okay, well, I was muting in case of, you know, for your, your presentation part. So if you want to unmute yourselves, you can also put your videos back on. I just try to keep it simple when people are presenting. Uh, we could do questions and answers about this and then go back into talking about the story, which <laughs> everyone has been sent out twice to all of you, uh, attached, and her story is is outstanding. It's called Blue as Blood. I was saying as blue as blood, but the title is Blue as Blood. So yeah. are there any questions, first of all, about the general path to publication? I, I'll start it. Do you have to live in New York City? No, I, I well, actually, I so I, I did live in New York City um, while I was for, for a while, but that is actually not when I got published. I got my first book deal when I was in, um, I was living in Boston and I now live outside DC. And that is where I was living when I got my new agent and my second book deal. So you do not have to live in New York city. Um, in fact, I would say when I got my first book deal, I knew absolutely nobody. I'd been to a few Boston area science fiction conventions. I knew some other authors, um, but really, I got all my information about how to submit and where to submit to from back in the from like a a paper book of writer's market that I that I used to have and I used to look through. And then once the internet became more of a source of knowledge, I looked there, but I did not have any personal connections. I sold my first book to someone I had never met or heard of before I started submitting books to her. Um, my agent was someone I'd never met or heard of. I met all of them in person only after. Um, we were working together with a book that they had already paid me money for. And then I went to New York to meet people. But before that, I knew no one and had no connections. That's interesting because if I can just interject, Ray Bradbury says precisely the opposite. Although we're talking about 1949, that Forey Ackerman staked him, helped him to go to, I think that would help him with money to go to New York because everybody was saying out in Los Angeles, you've got to get to New York and meet the the editors. And he, he stayed in a YMCA. He had no money, but he managed to meet this Walter Bradbury, I think his name by coincidence, from Doubleday. And he tracks his whole success to that start of Walter Bradbury buying the collection of stories that became the Martian Chronicles and the fact that he did feel he had to go to New York. But then things are different now. Well, I Actually. Yeah, I mean, so I also know authors now. I mean, so one of the one of the authors whose first book was published the same year as my first book met my editor at a conference, talked to her, the editor, you know, talked to her about what she was writing. My editor asked her to send her her book. So 
if you were, if she was here talking, she would say, yes, that's how to get in, go to conferences, meet editors. So I would say that's one way. Um, I'll okay. tell you that the way I got in was just by like mailing out envelopes to people I didn't know. <laughs> so okay. I think that, you know, there are many paths there are many paths and many different ways to break into the writing world. I would say from my experience, you definitely don't have to be in New York meeting people. Um, obviously, there are people who did get their start by being in New York and meeting people. I have another comment about conferences. When I think that can be a little bit vague to people. We have a big book festival called the Tucson Festival of Books, but it is not a publisher conference. People get confused. They go there. They think they're going to have opportunities. There are many of these huge attendance book festivals, but unless it's billed as some kind of a publisher's conference where they meet authors, then there's a difference. It's like two tiers. Ours is that second tier, the top tier. What is the big one? Is it the American Booksellers Association? Isn't that one of the biggest? Um, so, I mean, so again, so I have been to the big conferences, which are like like Book Expo America or the American mm -hmm. Library Associations. And I, I have four um, children. And when I when I got my first book deal, I was actually pregnant with my second children's with my second child. Sorry. So going to like flying across the country to conferences was never something that was really a very realistic option to me. I could only go to conferences when they happened to be in the city where I was. Um, or, you know, like when I got invited to BEA, I was living in Boston. So I took a train to New York because it was a big deal. I went to ALA when it was in DC and I lived near DC. Um, but again, I only went to those conferences after I was already published. I see a hand here. Thank you. Alice? That's me. Hi. Um, my question is, do you think, and based on your experience, should writers be reading what is currently being published and try to write to spec to some extent, or should writers write ac according to their own voice and according to their own style and keep trying to find someone who's interested in publishing what their own particular way of, their own kind of art? Right, so I mean, that's a complicated question. When it comes to writing to spec, I think that not only is it inadvisable, just for me personally, because again, if you're writing, you're writing because you love writing and you don't want to kill your love of writing by letting the audience into your writing process that early. I also think that once you're reading what's being published now, all those books were acquired two years ago. So reading what's being published now doesn't actually tell you what editors are buying now. In fact, it's possible that if something is super popular now, the market is already flooded with those books um, and editors will say, you know, we're not the, we can't buy any more of these books. The market is too saturated. So I am personally in favor of writing what you want to write. Now, with that said, I'm someone who has written like triple the amounts of books that she's published. So I'd say for every book that I've published, there are at least two manuscripts that I couldn't sell. Um, you know, and at a certain point, I did get very tired of this. At this point, I have an agent who is very market savvy. That's the main reason that I switched from my first agent to my second agent. So what I'll usually do is I'm the kind of person who has a bunch of ideas at once. So I'll usually email her and say, hey, these are like the five ideas that I'm excited about. If there are any of these that you absolutely cannot sell, please tell me because I won't write that one. But I don't really want to hear from her. Oh, this, you know, please write a, you know, fantasy romance about like, you know, people battling in a dragon training school, just as a random example, because um, <laughs> that's what's hot right now. Like, I don't want to write what's hot. Um, I've also gotten to the point in my career where I really don't want to write a whole book that is unsellable. So, for example, the book that I, the manuscript I wrote before my first book got published was about vampires. And I had absolutely no idea that vampires were dead, that nobody was publishing vampires, or rather they were publishing vampires, but there were several established vampire series and there was no room in there for new vampire books. Um, and honestly, if I, was, if I was less sitting in my room, sending out envelopes and more going to conferences and talking to other people at that point in my career, maybe I would have known that. Maybe I wouldn't have written, you know, spent a whole year writing a manuscript that had no chance of selling. So there are pluses and minuses. So I try to I try to find the sort of middle ground where I'm going to write what I want to write, even if it's not what the market is super hot for right now. Um, but I try to avoid writing things that are basically unsellable. Um, and that's me because I tend to have multiple ideas at a time. If I had one idea at a time and I really love that book, I would just write it because right now there are many options for writers 
you know, even if something is not publishable in traditional publishing, there's indie publishing, there is self-publishing, which is its whole, its own whole different thing, which I don't know much about. You have to be a business person to do that. But there are other ways to get your book out there. So if I had one idea I was passionate about, I would write it and figure it out then. Um, if you're the kind of writer who has like different ideas that you're playing around with, I would say maybe think a little bit about whether any of them is unsellable, but I wouldn't try to specifically write something that seems hot because by the time you finish your book, it might not be anymore. Thank Good you. answer. And I think very helpful. Um, the other thing, you know, when we mention things in passing like agents, I have had a lot of conversations with people about agents and it seems almost like catch 22. If you're somebody who's got some visibility and is saleable, agents want you. And even if they take you, and you're just way at the bottom and they're mildly interested, then they're not going to do anything. They're working on all their important clients and you're, you're kind of hanging there for a while. They have you as a client, but they're not going to do much for you. And isn't that kind of a problem with agents? I mean, I have done two agent searches um, and I, I know from experience, they are super frustrating. It's very difficult. It, it does feel like it's harder to get an agent than it is to get a publisher. My first book I sold directly to a publisher. This was back when you could do that. I don't know if that's even doable right now. Um, but basically I tried to look, I tried to search for an agent. I got nothing but form rejections. Like nobody was even interested in looking at it. And when I, when I sent to publishers, I got a bit more of a positive response. And I think that's because an agent really wants to take a book if they can think of a bunch of places they can send it to. Whereas a publisher can look at a book if they think they themselves might want to publish it. In a way, it is a lower bar to get into a publisher than to get than to get an agent. Um, at the same time, that was you know over 20 years ago that I sold my first book. I don't know if it's actually possible to sell a book directly to a publisher now. Um, it seems to me like you probably need an agent, and I can also tell you, an agent can also do much more for you than just sell your book. Different agents have different skills and do different things, but they can help you edit. They can, you know, in addition to just sending the book to publishers, they often have personal relationships with, you know, editors. They know what people are looking for. They have their finger on the market in a way that you can't. And they can also kind of give you career advice. You know, they can also submit to multiple publishers at a time. They can kind of try to arrange auctions and preempts. There, there's really a lot an agent can do for you. So even though, um, you know, again, I spent years and years looking for an agent and I know how frustrating it is and how you just feel like there's a black wall and you're on one side of it and, you know, the publishing industry is on the other side of it and there's just no way to break through. Um, you know, I felt that frustration. There were times when I was like, I'm never getting another agent. That's it. My publishing career is over. Um, you know, so with all that said, I do think it's kind of the only way is to, you know, to try to get an agent and you just... Really, it's just tough. There are a lot of people who want to write books. Um, you know, you just have to keep trying. And you just, you know, eventually, again, it's it's about skill and it's also about perseverance. You know, because there's the matter of how good your manuscript is and there's a matter of how well it fits the market. And then there's also the matter of pure luck. If it lands on the desk of the person who loves it on a day when they're in a mood <laughs> to like it, you know, it's, it's, it's really... It can be really frustrating on like other careers where there's a clear stepping stone. You do this, you do this, you advance. It seems a little, there, there's always going to be a little bit of luck involved, but there's really nothing we can do as writers except try. Well, this has been most helpful. And I hope, I don't know if people are making physical notes anymore, but I hope those of you who are aspiring writers and you know, aspiring writers, some of the, you know, this is a mixed bag of people with varying levels of professional experience, but this was invaluable, what you just said. I have another point that may be equal and, you know, not everybody knows this stuff, Leah, thank you, thank you. But anyway, <laughs> um, another problem is, do you settle? Even if it's not, yeah, I guess you'd call it self-publishing, but it's a step above self-publishing with a very small publisher, or do you hold out to get one that people may have heard of? What, what's your feeling on that? I guess it depends on what stage in your career too. Well, it also depends what you want for that specific book, because I don't think a smaller independent publisher is necessarily settling. Sometimes that will actually be the best thing for your book, because with a big publisher, you do have a big publisher with all that marketing power behind them. Doesn't mean they're going to spend it on your book, <laughs> right? They might. So you have the chance that they will. And it's great when they do. 
but sometimes they don't. Whereas independent publishers, you know, they have much less power, but you also will often get much more attention from them. So it kind of, so a, a lot of it depends on, you know, what you want for your book. I know people who have gone to smaller publishers and they were like, and they will never go back to big publishers because, you know, they just, they just like the feeling of working with a small publisher and how much more control you have and, you know, how much more back and forth there is. Um, you know, if you're depending on your writing for income, then there's no question that a small publisher cannot match, you know, the kind of money that a big publisher can pay you. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to each one, but I, I don't think going for a smaller or independent publisher is necessarily settling. It's really a question of what you want for your book. And there are also, I would say there are some smaller independent publishers who really your books won't be in bookstores, like they don't have a big Barnes and Noble presence, but some of these independent publishers really have great library marketing. So you have to think about what you want. Like I really want my books to be in libraries. So I would not go with a publisher that doesn't have library presence, but a small publisher where my book won't be in Barnes and Nobles, but it will be in, you know, a large number of libraries. I would, that is something I would definitely go for, you know, if it's right for that book. Oh, thank you. That's very helpful. And uh, I hope everybody again has paid attention to that one because a lot, this is the kind of fine detail among small publishing versus self publishing versus large um, publishing house that people just don't have a feel for. And of course you do, there are stages, you can go back and forth. You're not yeah. always in one or always in the other. Yeah. And I will say, I saw your lineup. You have a great number of impressive authors talking, which is wonderful because what I'm telling you is what I have learned in, about publishing through my specific track through publishing. But really anytime anyone in the publishing industry talks to you, even if it's an agent or an editor, they're telling you what they know from their own experience in publishing. And someone else might come and say something completely different from me. And what they said is what they've learned through their track through publishing. Um, you know, and each one is equally valid. There are so many, like you said about getting in through conferences versus getting in with knowing nobody. You know, so people, people can do it both ways. And one person might come and say, this is the way I did it. But you shouldn't come away from that saying, oh, this is the and, you know, someone else might come along and say, actually, I prefer smaller publishers because this has been my experience. You know, they're also right. There are just so many different um, tracks and different ways that people have interacted with the publishing world. And the more people you hear from, the better picture you get. And one other thing I should have raised my hand, I'm sorry, is that, again, I, I wrote a not wrote. I edited a book on Ray Bradbury. So I tend to think of his, you know, examples and. I knew a woman in California, actually, I still know her, B. Jo Trimble. She's an old time fan. And she knew Ray when he was like a kid, you know, in his 20s. And she said the thing everybody knew about Ray in Los Angeles, he was like hot and cold running water. If they opened a laundromat, he'd be there with his <laughs> books, you know, in front of the laundromat. And I think he, he says that too, you know, his life was full of surprise, surprise that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been on that street corner talking to that whoever showed up when he was selling books in LA, I mean, selling newspapers in LA. Right. So part of it is being out there, right? Not giving up and, and holding up. Right. So it can be, but again, like I said, cause I go to more conferences now because my kids are older, but mm -hmm. when I broke in, I really was not out. You know, I really was not out there very much. Um, you know, I really wasn't interacting with that many people in real life. I was really mostly mailing out query letters. Mm -hmm. Again, because I just had small, you know, there were conferences in Boston that I would manage to go to, you know, I wouldn't even manage to go to the whole conference. I'd go to the conference for one day. Um, so I would say I do think it's valuable to be out there and you never know who you'll interact with and what opportunities will come up from that. But if that's not something that's doable for you right. for financial or health or family reasons, you know, don't don't feel like you're like you're stuck because that's it wasn't possible point. for me at that point in my career. And, you know, it was. Mm -hmm. There might have been some advantages to me if I had been able to do it, but I was able to manage without it. Well, it's just probabilities. And I, that's good that you added that because people shouldn't get discouraged if they can't be like Ray Bradbury. Right. <laughs> Every time a laundromat opens, be there with their 10 books, you know. Um, no, that's a good point. But it, it's sort of like probabilities. If you're out there and visible, you may. It's It's like ordering a book from Amazon where you know the book you want and you order it versus going to the library and something might hit your eye. Right. 
and being out there, that's where that kind of chance comes in. So I just thought that would be a note to keep in mind people that have the option one way or the other to budget in some time to be out in these public spaces. So this has been very, very densely packed information. Does anyone else want to share about your path to publication? I, I know a couple of you have some pretty good credentials. So, you know, or track records. Anybody? You may agree or you may have another path. Let's we'll see who's here. Oh, they're all still here. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm giving you the chance now. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Anything else beside your own path? Any other questions to Leah? I, I'm trying to figure out how to raise my hand and I can't. Oh, oh, there you are, Jim. I was kind of waiting for you in particular. Why isn't he? Well, you go down to reactions, Jim. Do you have that on your screen? Just for a, a future yeah. reference. It's a little smiley face on mine and it has a, a reactions under it. Then when you click on it, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I, I, uh... I just one thing that struck me was I I agree with uh, well, with many of the things you said, but one thing that I think is is really important you said uh, don't wait, just write the next book or just write the next story. And uh, I very early um, I set a rule for myself. Um, I wouldn't allow myself to uh, submit the manuscript I just completed until I had first written the first chapter of the next book I wanted to write. That's so very it, smart. <laughs> it, it forced me, and, and, and it was kind of weird. It, I'd, I'd write that first chapter, you know, maybe 3,000 words, and, you know, and then suddenly I was, you know, excited about writing that book and didn't want to take the time to submit, but I, for, I forced <laughs> myself to submit, but that meant I got back to writing, and uh, that if I if I ever did anything right, that was the one thing. And, and yeah, so I just... no, I that that is. Thank you for bringing that up. That's something I should have said. That is my main strategy for dealing with rejections: is to already be working on something else. Because then when they when I get the rejections, I'm like, okay, but you know the, this other thing that I'm working on, I'm so excited about it. It's so much better. So even if everyone rejects this one, that's cool. The next one will be the thing. <laughs> but I. I... I, I did that for 30 years writing and, you know, I think I finished five or six novels in that time, always rejecting with nothing but rejections. But, um, you know, it was it, it took 30 years for me to finally have some success. So, um, you know, I it, I just think and that's what I tell people all the time. The best thing you can do to sell your next book is, or to sell your last book is to write the next one, you know. And just keep writing. So you, you did kind of say that, and and it really struck home with me. And I just wanted to to um, uh, mention that. But thank no, you very much. Thank you. I sort of said that, but you actually said it, and it's it's a very important thing to say. So I appreciate it. <laughs> but that's all. That's all I had. So. All right. Any other questions about Any publication other? or? Do you want to talk about the story? <laughs> or memorable people that you've been helped? How about mentors? Mentors and, and angels that came into your life? Um, so I'm going to be honest, I didn't really have any. I read oh. a lot about how to submit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've known some very nice people. I'm very happy. My first editor at HarperCollins really taught me um, how to revise books, which was something, you know, I kind of done before with critique groups, but I didn't really know and, you know, made me into a better writer. I'm very grateful to her. But again, that was only after that was after I had broken in. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody really helped me with the breaking in or getting published process. I learned about it by reading things that people had written. Um, I just didn't again, I just wasn't connected. I don't think, you know, I think when I got published, I think I knew one other published, I knew one published author. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anyone else who was published or who was a writer. Well, you're, you're really an inspiration to us all then, because a lot of these stories that when they get up on the, on the stage, you know, at World Science Fiction Con, they'll start telling this one helped me this way and this one helped me that way. And I have to admit, I'm not a published science fiction writer, but you can see I'm involved in science fiction and Isaac Asimov helped me. 
Oh, he was wow. a good friend. And he's, he, I think he wrote 10,000 letters in his life that they know of. And he would find fans who were struggling, who were nobodies, maybe not from a very well-off you know, situation. And he would take his time. And, and remember, that man's time meant money, too. And he would take <laughs> his time, and he would write to them. I have a thick envelope of cards and letters from Isaac Asimov. That is amazing. And I, I want to put that out there because there's a lot of scuttlebutt. Oh, he pinched me at a convention from women. You know, he blah, 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 blah. Well, he, he never did anything like that. And <laughs> was very kind to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to balance these anecdotal things. And I just know that about him. And he was very modest that he didn't go around saying, hey, I'm helping all these people that are, you know, struggling. But I, I just wonder who all the rest of us are that, you know, a whole constellation of us. See, I stayed with it. I stayed with science fiction. A lot of it has to do with Martha Beck. You, you people wouldn't know who she was, but some fans in my own area that helped me, Isaac, um, Alex and Phyllis Eisenstein, your pros, and um, you know other people. You actually made me realize that actually I misspoke when I said no one helped me because um, even though the story that we're discussing was published in fantasy and science fiction, my first professional sale was actually in Asimov's science fiction magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and the way this happened was I, I, wrote, I write mostly fantasy. I hadn't written that much science fiction, but I wrote a science fiction story and I sent it to Asimov's and Sheila Williams, the editor of Asimov's, this was back in the day when everything was not online. So I had sent it in the mail and she sent me back, you know, a paper rejection slip. And on the rejection slip, she had written like, you know, it was just a form rejection slip. And she had written in pen, not this one, but please send me more. Um, and that, that it just, it meant so much to me. This was before I had really published anything professionally. And I was like, well, that's, that became my goal in life, get published in Asimov's. And, you know, so I started writing science fiction stories before that I'd really written mostly fantasy. Um, and at this point, when it comes to short fiction, I would say I write mostly, um, I write mostly science fiction and I've actually, I've been published and she did actually take my next one. Um, that I sent her, and I've been published in Asimov's science fiction magazine probably more than anywhere else. Now, so, you know, Sheila Williams, the editor guy. of Asimov's, actually was go. someone who helped me. So, you there know, you go. So, this is like degrees of separation. See, um, I met him at conferences, and then he used to write me, and then I went on to stay involved. And I probably wouldn't be married to an astronomer if I hadn't stayed because I can go into that later. It won't bother <laughs> me with it, but. That's the interface between a humanities person and the sciences with science fiction. Right. And, and we called him Uncle Isaac anyway. <laughs> but uh, So there's there's a lot there about, do you think it's coincidence or it's, it's just the world is, you know, kind of small when you, and, and too bad you didn't, all I'll say right now is too bad you never got to, you never met him, right? No. Oh, too bad. But you can see him. <laughs> he has a presence on YouTube. I mean, I read I read all his books when I was younger. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, like, well, I don't know, 400 of them. No, I'm just, <laughs> I don't know how many there were, but I went through a period of time when I just like, just went through all his books. <laughs> so, you know, he is out there talking about various subjects on YouTube. And it, it isn't like meeting him, but I mean, at least then you have a feeling for what that presence was like. There may even be Asimov and Harlan doing shtick at, you know, world cons on YouTube. They, everything's showing up there. So you, you attempted to bring up the story. Now, now this is the part I'm really excited about, but I was excited about all the rest. And for those who have not had the wonderful privilege of reading this story yet, I, I hope you will. And uh, how shall we get into it? It's, it's a very interesting story because it, it isn't like everything else. It's It's got, well, would you say it has any any similarities at all to what Ursula Le Guin does with other cultures? Were you at all? You um, yeah. Not really, because I didn't get that deeply into yeah. the culture. Really, my my base idea was about, you know, a, an alien culture where the color blue was like a taboo, um, you know, and a human girl who was raised in that culture and then came back to Earth where, you know, nobody cared about the color blue and she just had a visceral negative reaction to it. Um, and then I kind of built the story around that. So everything else I built up about, you know, the medical treatments, this was all really just a way to make, you know, to devise a plot that would make right, right, the central right. idea work. Um, and, you know, and the idea came to me without my doing any research. Once I was working on the story, 
there's like a lot of fascinating research about the color blue and like whether humans even ever identified blue as a separate color. I don't have an opinion on that. I listen to a lot of podcasts. A lot of people have strong opinions. I don't. Um, but I'm saying all that research and science and world building really came while I was writing the story. <laughs> like this is one of these ideas where if you ask me where I got the idea, sometimes mm -hmm. I know, but with this one, I don't know. I can tell you a lot of things that I did around the idea, but they all came after the central idea. Well, it's hard science fiction. I mean, you know, if we want to go into labeling, then, but I would tend to say it's in that direction because they're, you're not just mentioning a, a laser gun. It's critical to the plot. Yes. The, you know, the, the difference. It's, a, it's about difference, too, and about fears. I mean, these are very deep, and a lot of people take that into the fantasy realm, but this is hard science fiction about difference, about how much can you take of difference before you're, I can't do that, you know, it's it's, it's just right. very deep, this story. It, whatever it was, it touched you in a very deep way, I think. Oh, here comes another person. You going to ask something, Alice? You got to unmute it, Alice. I know. my. I'm having a terrible problem with my light sources here. Um, well, first of all, I was going to say that I wear blue almost every day and almost all my clothing is blue, but today I wore brown in honor of the storm. <laughs> oh, you know, blue is actually my favorite color. <laughs> it's my favorite color too. Well, you're, you're almost, everything I, almost everything I own is blue. But I was as I was reading the story, I was trying to think, is there some taboo that like this for me is there something that I feel this way about that other people ignore and neglect and hurts me and upsets me and I guess it's the fact that I'm you know alternately vegan and vegetarian but have mostly been vegan and when other people are you know eating meat and I smell the meat they're eating and I see it on their plates I, I guess I have that experience with that difference but um, the story I, I felt was about taboos and how insensitive people can be about taboos that other groups hold very serious and uh, that are very important to their identity. And it had a strong impact on me and made me feel like I need to appreciate that even more and take that more into consideration. So it's a story that serves a social purpose as well as is entertaining and engaging. Um, Thank you. That's all I had to say. But I didn't wear blue today. <laughs> I didn't either, but I didn't think of it. Well, oh, there's a little bit. I, of I'm wearing blue. <laughs> <laughs> you are. And your book's all behind you are. So yes. <laughs> yeah. I, don't get, I don't get it really much of a say in my book covers, but I'm happy with that. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> The blueness so, of them. Fine. I don't know if our resident physician has anything to say. Tim, are you still with us? Tim Saba, do you have anything to say about blue and, or you know, colors and vision and anything on that level? Um, not, not really at this point, uh, Gloria. I'm following the discussions and the comments intently. Yeah, I, I don't know if really it's as she, as uh, Leah said, it, it's a metaphor. And and so the blue, the science of it, you know, even though it's interesting and we can look into that, may not be, the, you know, maybe a an off the topic thing. But right. I just felt I felt more reading this story than I felt reading whole volumes of science fiction magazines. It, it oh, well, not only has real concept, real science, and um, that's possible, and but it also hits you between the eyes. And I, Alice, do you agree? It's it's very moving in a way, many stories. Um, yes, it is. And the ending caught me off guard. I I wasn't expecting, even though the, and I won't, you know. It's reveal, so hard. I won't <laughs> reveal it, but the ending caught me off guard, even though the father had said at one point that he would do that for her if he could. The ending was still a surprise to me. Thank you. Um, I mean, so the truth is, it's an unusual kind of ending for me. I usually like to end stories on a much more hopeful or even handed or like 
you know, sort of peaceful note, but, you know, I had to be true to the story. So I was like, this character, what would this character do? Not what would I do? You know, I created a character who feels a certain way and who has a lot of anger. And I was like, well, what would this character do if given the chance? And that is what I'm going to have her do. I ju just, just to explain my previous answer, I didn't have a chance, did not have a chance to read the story. That's why I, I'm just following and, and very likely I would be reading it very soon. So, Thank you. Yes. And if you want to forward your comments to Leah, I can I can forward them for you or you know, whatever. Oh if yeah. You definitely. People to contact you directly, you can put your contact in or I can just forward. Sure. It. I will I'll put it in the chat. Hold on. Thank you. And I wish see this is what we have um been having this group for about 10 years. We used to meet in person. And it this is exactly the purpose of this group, Leah, is because fantasy and horror, there's so much out there. They way outnumber science fiction, you know, and even even adventure science fiction isn't quite this kind of science fiction. So right. we're really trying to encourage people to use there are many people who are teachers in in uh universities and and you don't have to have a PhD in in visual, um, I don't know what you'd call it, visual psychology in order to write this story, uh, whatever it would be, <laughs> right. whatever the, the field would be called, uh, perceptual psychology um, and, and bio, whatever, neurobiology. But you could still, you pulled it off. And we had a feeling that we got enough information, we weren't overwhelmed, and you can write real science fiction that that you take the science out and the story goes away without having a PhD in any of those fields. And that's what we've been trying to be like a seed bed for people to write this because it used to be a big part of science fiction. If right. you go back, you know, in Asimov's day and Bradbury, well, he was kind of a little bit softer, but Rand, um, Arthur C. Clarke and, and oh, I could name them all, but I'm not going to scratch my brain. Right. It was a big part of science fiction. And that part seems to be shrinking as the other genres are growing. I don't think I'm mistaken on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because it's actually, I think there are still more places, if you're talking about short fiction, there mm -hmm. are still more places to publish science fiction than to publish fantasy. Meaning there are, you know, like Asimov's and Analog, for example, will only publish science fiction. There are a few places that will only publish fantasy, but for the most part, it's either science fiction only or science fiction and fantasy. So mm -hmm. if, if you're a writer of short fiction, um, you know, science fiction is actually a better bet oh, <laughs> if you like to write it. But yeah. if you're writing novels, it's it seems to be, you know, not not such a good bet because I don't well, I don't I don't really know. I, I've given up. I'm bad at marketing when it comes to novels. That's why I send those ideas to my agent and let her <laughs> tell me. <laughs> I'm always off. I'll always yeah. on my own, I'll always be the person, you know, writing a vampire novel in 2008. So <laughs> I don't give marketing advice. Right, right. I think that the attitude towards science itself has changed. And, and it used to be that people found it so fascinating. It was equal in imaginative power to fantasy and horror. But now so much is out there. And, and we aren't in a space period, a space launch period of any right. great interest. Things get launched and we do, you know, somebody goes back to the moon, big deal. It's not like the first time when that was you know, a big deal for people and kids all were excited in their science classes. And now things have things have become real and naturalized. For instance, on our campus, there are little robots delivering pizza at the University of Arizona all over campus. And, you know, they stop and, and you can stop them and mess with them and they don't hurt you. But, but who would have thought in our lifetimes there would be robots, you know, little robotic vehicles delivering pizza Right. Yeah, I remember once I was I was in a library and I was trying to do some research. I came across an old book about space exploration. I was looking through it and the person had written, you know, he had written this whole like lengthy introduction about how it is inherent in human nature to search for new frontiers. And therefore, we're always going to be like looking out for space. And like it's it's part of human nature that we're going to be trying to get to space. And, you know, I was like, well, I don't I think I think you might have been wrong <laughs> I think you might have been wrong about that, but I feel like there was a, 
there was there was certainly a sense of what was going to happen in the future um, back then that may not exist the same way now. But in a way, you know, back when people thought that robots would do whatever, and now you're seeing that they're delivering pizza in a way that's kind of more interesting. I feel like it gives a chance to write science fiction stories that are. I, I tend to write stories that are a little more smaller and a little more character focused, and not about you know the universe, but about science you know, science fictional innovations and how they're going to be interacted with and dealt with by individual people. Yes, so. yes. And that's really the most interesting kind of science fiction. It also links up with uh, S.B. Divya, Machinehood. This is a writer from an Indian background and, and she's a, a, you know, Silicon Valley IT scientist, computer system scientist in Silicon Valley who is now, a, I think, a full-time writer as well. And she, one of her stories. Yeah, I mean, I think her book has been quite successful. So. Oh, you've been I saw she was on, Yeah. Yeah. I saw and, she was on your program. Has she has yeah. she been here already or she is in the yes, future? Yes, yeah. She's been here already okay. and you can find her on YouTube. And um, again, that's what she says, is that it's as things become naturalized that used to be well beyond what's really doable, it changes what the sense of wonder, but I, I mean, the universe will always be out there and there, it, right. the, the interest in us putting people out there, that's a separate issue, but the universe itself is out there and, and you know, these non-man things go way beyond what people can do. And, and even if you don't have them, then there are these telescopes that can see farther and farther. Right. So, you know, that kind of curiosity, I think remains, but I, to get the masses, you know, the masses of people that would fill a, a football stadium, you have to have people out there carrying the football, you know, and right. we're, not, we're not so uh, revolving around that anymore. And you're right. It, it's a different way of thinking. Maybe I should quit thinking of it as a win-lose, uh, more of it's a it's different. Just, it's just different, yeah. It's just different. All right. Any other any final any other, questions? Any other final questions? And I, I do hope you will read the story. I send it to everyone. And uh, it's well, not to you out there in YouTube who are, who are following this on YouTube. If you're already on my mailing list or you can, um, I don't know if you can, but you can contact me if you're on our, our mailing list and I will send you that uh, story and then you can read right it. and you can also it was also it was published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction so that's you right. can you can buy back issues from them that's right i was going to mention like through yeah. the story yeah so you know get a back issue or or yeah probably better you do it that way but um it is well worth getting a back issue because as i recall there were some other really good stories in that particular issue of course yours stood out <laughs> that's how i know <laughs> you but yeah, get the back issue and they're out there. So um, anything, any final questions, anybody? Oh, Alice, you had an, an you were gonna make an announcement about next month. Yes, I am. Should I do that now? Yeah, go ahead. I, do you mind, Leah? She, uh, no, of course not. She's the wife of our, uh, well, she's gonna be the co-presenter next month. Go ahead, Alice. No, actually, Greg is gonna uh, be the uh, presenter. He, okay. he, just, he just came back. Um, from spending a month in the Czech Republic at where he does spend a lot of time and um, more than I do. And he's a translator um, from Czech into English. And next month, he's going to be presenting on the science fiction of Josef Nesvitba. And he plans to talk about the Czech science fiction writer, Josef Nesvitba, who died in 2005 and he says he was uh, Nesvidbo was a leading representative, along with Stanislav Lem and Boris and Arkady Strugatsky of Central and East European science fiction during the communist era. Nesvidbo was a psychiatrist by pro profession and was internationally noted for writing stories that served as a laboratory examining morality, ethics, and philosophy. And he was a interesting nice man that I know Gloria knew and Greg knew and I only talked to him on the phone but he was always very you know pleasant and humane and Greg is a writer and translator and has spent a lot of time in the Czech Republic um, since 1993 
and he put together the Yosef Nesvedba page a long time ago, and it's still online. And Gloria will be sending out a link to that page, and you can read. And I believe there's link. There are links to five of Nesvedba's stories that Greg translated, and you'll be able to read them there. Wow. Wow, Amazing. that's fantastic. And and I'm so looking forward to this because I have studied Czech science fiction myself. I, I can read Czech a little bit, not, not well among my three or four languages. But one thing I need to mention, although you're limiting the time frame to under communism, but I want to go back just a step before that and also include Kadel Chapek. Have, have you heard of him, Leah? Um, I've not I actually heard of a couple of, of the people that um, Alice mentioned, but I've not heard of him. Well, you, this one you're going to want, you're going to, it'll knock your socks off. The word robot came from Karel Chapek's 1920 play, R.U.R., Rosum's Universal Robots. So Nesvaba himself was already a second generation of very prominent you know, writers, but I'd say, you know, Chapek, of course, became world, except nobody knows him. We know the word robot, which came from his play. And actually, you know, his brother, they were, they worked together and they have come up with it. But it's, it's in all, it's in all the world languages. And that play is the actual origin of our word robot. So it comes from Czech. A lot of people don't know the word robot comes from Czech. Oh, that is fascinating. So there, there is <laughs> I did not huge, know that a huge history of science fiction in, in that little tiny place. So as, as Alice and Greg, you know, they're, they know all this stuff, but, and it actually, it, uh, it even goes back, if you want to take it further to the golem of Prague, mm -hmm. because I'm mm -hmm. sure Chapek was influenced by Rabbi Lowe and the golem and, you know, the, these things, and Mary Shelley may have also heard that story when she came up with Frankenstein. So, that, you know, not to take any of his, points he's going to bring up but this is this is a place of alchemy and of robots and all kinds of stuff so you all want to come back for this thing next month yeah <laughs> okay so all, all right. right with that with that weird alchemy ending <laughs> and thank you so much leah Cypress. this has been so helpful i think to so many people we are cool thank basically. you for having me thank you all for coming and for the questions I really appreciate it. It's really nice to see you guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we will be back in December. Take care, y'all. Hey. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>